All truths go through three stages. First, it is mocked and ridiculed. Then, it is violently opposed. And finally, we accept it as being evident. Slavery, women's rights, LGBTQ rights, gender equality, all movements went through these stages. One of the most defining truths that will be evident for future generations is the answer to this question. Is it possible that we humans as a species have been eating the wrong food? I was 16 when I traveled with my school overseas for the first time. We went to London and we had a great time. We visited the city. We had beautiful weather. At the end of that day, a teacher pulled me aside. And when I saw the look on his face, my heart stopped. And this is how I learned that my father died of cancer. Whenever I speak about this, people empathize and they share their own story and how they too have lost someone they love. A parent, a mentor, a friend. And as painful as it is, the truth is we have become so accustomed to this happening to us. It has become so common that we accept being sick and dying early as part of life. Throughout my younger years, I was quite a sick kid and I spent many years of my life in hospital and I was just really, really weak. With nephrotic syndrome that I had, it required me to be on a whole host of steroids that really stunted my growth and also made me obese. And I felt really, really unconfident in my own skin because I always remembered when I was younger, I always wanted to kind of tuck in my shirt, but I couldn't tuck in my shirt. And I remember when I was in primary school, my friends and my classmates used to call me a double scoop ice cream with a cherry on top. I still remember those days where, you know, all these guys were playing basketball and badminton and everything. And there I was this fat kid that just wanted to kind of fit in. I remember watching Commando and Rambo 1, Rambo 2, Rambo 3 and looking at, at Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger and looking at those guys, man, I want to look like those guys. So I think that's how I kind of really got, all right, I want to start going to the gym and start the train. And so I went into the local gym just to start doing weight training. And of course, being a teenager, you just wanted to grow biceps and chest and nothing else. So that's all I did. I was always focused on protein, just getting big. And I was literally having like five to six kilos of meat per week. So we had like a chicken day, we had a fish day, we had a pork day, we had a um, beef day. I, I just really didn't know any better. Naturally, I've never been somebody who ate a lot of meat. I would probably eat like red meat once a month, fish probably once or twice a week, a bit of chicken, but mostly it was like beans and, and tofu. That's what I've always preferred. Uh, but then when I moved in with him, like I needed to accommodate his diet. I have always loved to cook. I had to eat the same way he did. My digestive system was really bad. I felt I was retaining water. I felt like, yeah, I really didn't feel my best. <laughs> and, and it was just, I, would, I remember training in the morning, like super early morning and just feeling so lethargic. But because what I had, like, like I had like a steak. Yeah, for 5 a.m. 5 a.m. we heated up a strip of steak with a knob of butter. Because we believed that carbs were bad. And, and I still remember when we went to the cafe and we had our bacon and eggs and we saw someone across eating Having fruits. Having fruits and we're like, like, oh, look oh my at God, that there's person. There's so, so much sugar, sugar in there. So it was just, we were just like, I don't know, we were just stuck in our own ways. And yeah, it just felt worse and worse and worse. If we look at the leading cause of death, in the world, way more than wars, violence, and accidents. The leading cause of death is chronic disease. So disease like cancer, heart disease, strokes, diabetes, and these diseases together kill more than 30 million people every year. That's more than the entire population of Shanghai and Singapore combined together, or half of the UK, or more than the entire population of Australia dying of these diseases 
every single year. And when we look at these numbers, actually a really small fraction is caused by genetic predisposition, but more than 90% can be attributed to lifestyle choices, including diet. So here we are, running around, desperately looking for a cure to all these illnesses when the cure is in the prevention. Recently, a few years back, the WHO classified processed meat as a type 1 carcinogen. And in fact, it becomes worse for you when you do things like put it on a grill, cook it, or have it with your deli cold cuts in a sandwich. In spite of this WHO classification, there's been very little recognition around it. It hasn't really moved the needle in terms of what's available at your grocery store or what's available on your plate when you go to a restaurant. I think the way I was supplementing was to, to kind of fuel a nutritionally void and highly acidic and inflammatory diet. I had a lot of joint issues. I was big. I was probably a lot bigger than I am right now. I had a lot of joint issues. I was quite lethargic. I couldn't really run at all. I remember when the tram was right over there and I had to run for the tram, I just let it go because I said, you know, running is catabolic for my muscle mass, so I'm not going to run. Really, in, in, in actual fact, I just didn't have the energy. Every single meal was, I felt bloated, I felt in pain. Just going for nice dates and nice places that I should have enjoyed, I was fearing going there. I knew I was feeling bad after. Like, it would just kill all the romance, all the fun that there should be around going to a nice place to eat, because I was just feeling so bad. So at what point did you decide to do something about it? So after about like a year and a half of dating, I was like, I need to do something. And I saw on Facebook there was a girl that I know I just saw the pictures of her, of her food and it was like lots of fruits and I, I couldn't believe I was like, how can somebody just eat fruits for a meal? This is like too much sugar, it's not healthy. But she looked so good, like her eyes were bright, her, her skin was beautiful, like I was just like, I, I want to do what she does. I remember going to work and just buying a bunch of fruits as my lunch. I remember having like two or three bananas in a row and being like, oh my God, this tastes so amazing, I want that. And then I would say within a couple of days, most of my digestive problems were gone. I saw a significant shift in her energy and just her digestion and I was kind of inspired, like, okay, what's going on? I made the switch and I remember that morning itself, I went to my gym with a big 800 grams of tofu. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So I was just like, all right, well, I'm just gonna substitute out gram for gram protein and see what happens. I was a little bit gassy because of course, it's like 800 grams of tofu and beans that's gonna get you gassy. But I actually felt like the, my digestion was better. Although I was gassy, it was better. And I was having lots of fruits as well. Um, and all of a sudden I had this spike in energy. And I think a few days after I made that switch, I went for my first run with Emily. I think we ran 5Ks. And I was astounded how I just ran without stopping. I was like, where is this coming from? This is crazy. I could not run after a tram before. And now I ran 5K without stopping. I had to relearn what I knew about protein. And through what I learned, I realized we don't actually need that much protein. And there's this overemphasis on protein, particularly animal protein. And what I've, what I've learned now is that at the end of the day, it's not how much protein you consume, but how much you're actually assimilating. Because when you're under this kind of protein spell, which was where I was, I forgot about everything else. I forgot about, you know, what about my antioxidants? What about my fiber? Yeah, I just did not think of that. What girl's gonna go for me with a body like this? Hang in there, Tom. I'm you two years from now, cause you're drinking milk and working out. Well, I'm not changing so far. But milk's at work inside you. Oh yeah? And tomorrow the difference can show. All that protein for muscle and calcium for bones. But I'm still a skinny bench warmer. Hey, if the sight of yourself at 18 doesn't convince you, Tom, listen to your senior year girlfriend. Hi, Tom. I'm waiting. Milk, it does a body good. Growing up in America in the 1980s, 1990s, even the 2000s, you had a lot of ads on TV. Sitting there after school, watching cartoons, and then all of a sudden you see 
a photo or you see an ad, a video with some beautiful celebrity that you recognize and they've got this little white mustache across their face and the ad says, got milk. So there was always this culture of drinking milk and there was a lot of campaigns around drinking milk. The questions around the dairy industry really started to creep in when my parents started to get sick. My mother went through breast cancer and my father had heart disease and my father's a diabetic from the past. And I started to really look at what could be causing some of these things. Everything I looked at, all of the research that I read, kept on coming back to this idea of nutrition, especially in the case of people like my parents who had never had a drink in their lives, they never had a cigarette, and they were vegetarian through and through their entire lives. It really became, well, how do we isolate potential causes of, of what's making them sick? Because it wasn't also hereditary in my family. And I started looking at things like dairy, started to really then begin to understand how products like milk and cheese and other things that we really rely on as vegetarians in places like America actually get to our plate and what's really in them. To me, it just really does not make sense to, to drink the milk of another species. I'm a big supporter of breastfeeding, so I'm still breastfeeding my 16 months old. And to me, it, it just makes sense. Like yeah. my milk is made to suit a baby human. And the milk of a cow is made to suit a little calf. To go from a very small calf to become a big cow or a bull within a very short period of time. So how would that be health food for humans? In America, 80% of the antibiotics that are manufactured by the industry are actually pumped into and injected into animals, whether that's livestock that's slaughtered or that's cows you know, that then are making milk. Even if it's coming from a cow that's been, that's been in your backyard, whatever, it still contains the growth hormones, it still contains the estrogen because it's coming from... A pregnant lactating female cow. So it's the highest amount of estrogens in there and a the high level of estrogens actually contribute to things like prostate and breast cancer. By nature, our digestive tracts, the length of digestive tracts, the pH in our body and the dig digestive enzymes in our mouth, we are carbohydrate digesting organisms. So when we actually consume a diet that's natural to us, we will thrive. I mean, not just thrive in a sense of health, but we'll perform better, we'll think clearer, we'll digest better. And there's so much science now and research showing that a plant-based diet also not just gets you healthy, but promotes long-term health and longevity as well. For me, it's about being around for a very long time and to be a granddad, maybe to be a great granddad. If we look at the blue zones, places in the world where people easily reach 90, 100 years old, disease-free, one of the key factors that help them maintain a healthy lifestyle throughout their whole life is their diet. And their diet is more than 95% plant-based. I started changing my diet 17 years ago. Um, I turned vegetarian. Um, at that time, it was a very simple reason, um, just out of compassion for animals. And the one moment that shocked me was when I read about the United Nations report about climate change and the livestock industry. That was a huge shocker. Animal agriculture is actually one of the biggest factors in terms of hurting the planet and also severely uh, threatening the future of many generations and of the whole survival of mankind. Recently, I read a research um, that compared livestock or the key meat companies in terms of carbon footprint versus big oil companies. Now, we would think that the Exxon Mobiles of the world are the evil in terms of carbon footprint. But shockingly, when you look at the top five meat companies, their combined carbon footprint is bigger than the top oil companies in the world. We are like a runaway train right now, and we are accelerating, but the cliff is here. So it's only a matter of time. In fact, I think it's happening already.
we can't ignore the fact that animal agriculture has a massive impact on the oceans. We've got these dead zones that are being created because of the incredible amounts of nitrogen being put into the oceans. We've got coral reefs bleaching and dying, and we have to acknowledge that animal agriculture is one of the leading causes of global warming. As one out of three fish that's being caught in the oceans is being used to feed animals, and overfishing is a massive problem that we have to deal with if we want to survive as a species on this planet, then we have to seriously review our eating habits. The whole world is obsessed today with you know, cutting down plastic straw consumption, but the reality of it is that if you take all the straws around the world and you put them all into the ocean, that is still less than a tenth of a percent of the plastic that goes into the ocean every year. In fact, more than 40% of the plastic that goes into the ocean is plastic fishing nets. When I was 14 years old, I saw a picture of a dead minke whale being pulled up the slipway of an 8,000 ton factory whaling ship operating in the Antarctic. And that image really struck a chord to me. It became symbolic of this devastating relationship that we as a species have with the oceans. I think like most people, I thought that whaling was something that had ended in the 70s or 80s, that this was a victory of the conservation movement. So to find out that not only was it still happening, but it was happening despite the fact that there was a global moratorium on whaling made me feel the need to get involved and, and stop that crime from taking place. In the 1950s, there were over 50 industrial factory whaling ships operating in the Antarctic at any one time. Only one of those remain. It's a ship called the Nishin Maru. It's 8,000 tons, and it goes down to the Southern Ocean every single year and conducts illegal whaling in a designated whale sanctuary. This is the vessel that I saw a picture of when I was 14 years old and a vessel that had haunted my dreams ever since. I spent 10 years working with Sea Shepherd chasing the Nishin Maru around the Southern Ocean. And one of the most harrowing experiences that my crew and I had was when we were put in a position to block that 8,000 ton factory whaling ship from refueling, knowing that if we could cut off their fuel supply, then we would force them to head home early, cutting their whaling season short. I remember it was a very windstill day as the San Laurel, this massive oil tanker, was getting ready to receive this 8,000 ton factory whaling ship alongside. My crew and I essentially double parked the tanker, telling this 8,000 ton factory whaling ship that if they wanted to refuel, they would have to go through us to do it, that they would have to sink us to take on fuel. That resulted in a five day long confrontation where my vessel was sandwiched between these two massive ships. And ultimately this 8,000 ton factory whaling ship tried to push my vessel out of the way to take this position. But we stood our ground for the whales and we stood fast. And by doing so, when, when we put the captain of the Nishin Maru in the position where he would either have to back down or sink us, he ultimately had to retreat. That was a year where we saved the lives of 932 whales, a year where the Japanese whaling fleet reached only 10% of their bogus self-allocated quota. I think generally people feel incredibly passionate about whaling. Most people would never eat a whale, and yet if you look at the industrial fishing industry, you'll discover that over 300,000 whales and dolphins are being killed every single year as bycatch of the industrial fishing gear. I think globally food systems are broken and challenged. Today we have 800 million people around the world that are malnourished or hungry or starving, yet we feed cattle that's then slaughtered for food for a much, much smaller minority of people. With knowledge comes power and with power comes responsibility as well. And I believe that we need to have a collective mindset. It's no more about competition because this earth provides sufficient for everyone. But it's really the greed that creates this disparity and this mentality of scarcity. 
I think there's a tendency in the West that whenever illegal fishing or overfishing is discussed, that fingers are pointed at China. Most of the tuna that's being taken out of West Africa is being taken out of West Africa by the European fishing fleet in order to supply the demand for tuna in the West. What I've seen firsthand working all around Africa in combating illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing is this model that Noam Chomsky authored in terms of this is a transfer of so-called food from the needy to the greedy. And this demand that we have in the West, in wealthy countries for cheap, readily available fish is really leading to the seas being sucked dry out of waters where some of the world's poorest people are dependent on fish for their livelihoods. We as human beings today kill and consume a hundred billion land-based animals every year. That's more animals that we kill every year than all humans that have ever lived on Earth. If you start adding up the fish in the sea that we take out of the sea every year, that's another two, two and a half trillion. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the UNFAO, state that 90% of the world's fisheries are either fully exploited or overexploited. And if current trends continue, then by 2048, the world's major fisheries will be gone. Ten years ago, I was living in China and I adopted a dog, Boneda, and I learned that he was rescued from dog meat. And I was really shocked to learn that it was happening in a city like Shanghai. So whenever I found strays in the streets, cats and dogs, I rescued them. I was not just rescuing them from the streets, but also from the violence of what could happen to them. I thought I was doing my best for the longest time until about three years ago, I realized that I was saving some animals from being eaten, but I was eating other animals myself. As I was going through this realization, this awakening, I could see for the first time on my plate, not just meat, but actually the flesh of animals that had to live a terrible life and suffer and die just for a few moments of pleasure for me. I looked at my very expensive handbag and it was like a spell broke and I could see that it was just the skin of mutilated animals. I lived in China about 10 years ago and I remember buying a vintage fur coat and I showed it to one of my Australian friends who just told me, are you aware that this might be like a cat or dog fur? I was like, what are you talking about? This is impossible. And she was like, no, no, here they do eat cats and dogs and they do use the fur to make coats. And this is how I think I made the connection because I was like, okay, I am able to wear a fox without caring at all. And I could not like even a second imagine wearing a cat or a dog coat because they're my friends and I grew up with them. I think that's the turning point where I completely stopped fantasizing about fur. I've decided to go cruelty free because as a designer and influencer, I think it's our responsibility to act on something meaningful. Fashion can be seen as something quite superficial, without a meaning, careless about these kind of values. I think it's possible today to be trendy without being bloody, being fun without harming anyone. We cannot massively kill all these animals for coats, bags, shoes. I think people need to reconnect and I think they forgot the connection. They used to have it when they were kids, but I don't think they can make the connection and relate to the cute little lamb they see on Instagram and the lambskin bag they just bought on a high-end brand. As children, it is actually part of our nature to care and to have empathy towards each other, but also towards animals. But 
Somehow along the way, we are conditioned not to care. After millions of years of evolution, nature has selected empathy as a human trait. And that means it's there for a reason. If we look at the egg industry, where only the females are valuable because they lay eggs, every other chick that is born that is not female, so the male, are considered a waste product because they won't grow fast enough to be profitable and they also won't lay eggs. The most profitable way that the industry has found to deal with these baby chicks is to discard them as they hatch. We are grinding them up alive, gassing them, putting baby chicks in gas chambers. People tend to forget something very elementary, that a cow has to be pregnant and has to have a baby in order to produce milk, just like we humans or any other mammal. In the dairy industry, we want the milk to produce cheese and yogurt and ice cream. We force cows to be pregnant over and over. We take their babies away from them, one after the other, year after year, because obviously we don't want the babies to have the milk. The male are sent to slaughter for veal, and the female are raised to become dairy cows, just like their mothers. So it doesn't matter if the eggs or the dairy comes from a factory farm or a free-range farm. The matter of fact is all babies are taken from their mothers in the dairy farms and all the male chick are killed in the egg farms. And this is happening in the US, in Australia, in European countries, in Asian countries. It's happening everywhere. There's a huge social justice component to it. It's unfair and unreasonable for us to kill just for our food. We don't need it. But in spite of that, and in spite of it being very bad for you, we continue to do it anyway. Every single week, we are killing more than a billion animals. We are destroying our home planet, and it's all for foods that we don't need and that are making us sick in return. I think one of the reasons that people generally don't tend to care so much about fish is that the oceans are out of sight and out of mind for so many people. It's been said that if slaughterhouses had glass walls, then everybody would go over to a plant-based diet. Now imagine that those slaughterhouses were hundreds and hundreds of miles offshore, accessible only by boat. Fish don't have vocal cords, so their screams are silent, even though they have the same capacity to suffer as we do. But we also have to look at how language is used to justify slaughter. We go to the supermarket and we don't buy cow, we buy beef, we don't buy pig, we buy pork. And within the fishing industry, the language is chosen very specifically to make a disconnect between people and the products that they ultimately buy. We don't talk about the number of fish killed every single year, we talk about the number of ton of fish that's killed every year. We don't talk about fish being killed or hooked or netted, we talk about fish being harvested as if they were apples being picked off a tree in, in an orchard. And we don't talk about fish populations, we talk about fish stock as if they were simply taken off the shelf of a warehouse. So in one single sentence, you can talk about X number of ton of fish stock being harvested. It's no small surprise that there is a big disconnect between people and the fish they're eating. Well, the reality is, if we look at the urgency of the planet and the urgency of the whole macro issues, we should be turning our lifestyle upside down. People have emotional connection and relationship with food. Food is so much more than just filling our stomach or nourishing our body. It is social, it is emotional, it is cultural. One of the biggest challenges that I've faced uh, my entire life is when I go out with friends and there's zero or maybe one 
vegetarian option and it's now it's worse when it comes to vegan options. We need to improve the experience. If the world is going to become more sustainable, we need to really deliver on this idea of, of creating more plant-based options everywhere. I always say that for you know, ultimate health benefits, we should all be eating organic whole foods every meal. Unfortunately, we live in urban societies. Most of us do not have time to cook. We may not even have farms around us. In the case of Hong Kong, in the case of many cities or many countries around the world, I think the food tech space plays a crucial role in this food revolution and protein revolution. We have been relying so much on animals to be the key protein or ingredients in our meal. If you just ask people to switch to tofu and vegetables, that won't work. You know, I think Beyond Meat and Beyond Burger is one of the iconic examples of that. People were still very doubtful, you know, what does a vegan burger, how good could a vegan burger be? But now when any carnivore, or anyone for that matter, just get a bite of the Beyond Burger, majority, if not all of them, would say, hey, I can eat this every day. We work with a lot of these ingredients, plant-based chicken, plant-based burger, vegan eggs. Now, the ingredient itself is very exciting. We turn these ingredients into uh, dishes that really can fit the local palates. Steamed buns or dumplings, ultimate comfort food for Asian people. To always understand that the ingredient is one part, but the recipe, what we do with it, and how to close that cultural gap or bridge that gap is critical in terms of shifting people's behavior. I think to meet the urban lifestyle, also to meet the need that we have created, having these products is a good intermediate step. It certainly is an improvement over whatever meets products or processed meats that we eat. It's really our choice what kind of world do we want to live in. Today, I view this opportunity for people to go plant-based or be more plant-based as probably one of the, the defining triumphs that we can have from a sustainability perspective. Change can be scary because we think about everything we give up. We think about all the hassle. We worry about upsetting the people we care about. But actually, change is not about becoming someone else. And so when I changed, I changed the way I was living. I changed the way I was eating, but I became who I am. Being an animal lover is about putting all animals on the same level. It's about considering them as true characters with an emotional intelligence, feelings, and even a spiritual side. I think putting the energy of a suffering animal in your own sanctuary is something that cannot leave you at peace and you cannot be connected to the people and to life and love if you have a suffering energy inside you. I know many people tell me, well, everything in moderation, we need to have a balance. Moderation in that context doesn't make a lot of sense. Would we say that, oh, it's okay to kill in moderation? It's okay to destroy the planet in moderation? If we are in a position to choose, it means we are privileged. So we need to really think about the impact of our choices on others and on the planet. Sometimes I even question whatever we do, is that you know, barely going to make a difference at all? How much difference can one person make? That's one type of sentiment that I have. But on the other hand, when I look at a lot of these people who are working very hard, whether they're scientists, whether they're researchers, whether they're academics, whether they're entrepreneurs, whether they're investors, just channeling all their resources to this cause and doing whatever it takes to make a difference. And I am actually seeing real behavior change. On my first campaign with Sea Shepherd, we were patrolling the Galapagos Islands to stop the poaching of sharks for shark fins. I remember feeling really challenged by the fact that here we were pulling up eight kilometers of devastating, destructive fishing gear, but at the same time, there was enough of this gear set in the water 
all over the world to go around the world 80 times. And, and I remember thinking, well, what difference is this really making? But as the hooks were coming up on deck, I remember holding one of those hooks in my hand and as it gleamed under the moonlit night, I, I thought, well, this particular hook is not going to kill a sea turtle or a shark or a tuna this particular night. And to think that that doesn't make a difference is incredibly human-centered. And I remember holding this hook in my hand and thinking that, okay, maybe, maybe we can't save the entire world, but we can certainly save the entire world for one particular animal. Being at sea is dangerous in and of itself, especially if you're going down to the Southern Ocean where there are dangerous ice conditions to navigate. It's not uncommon to have eight, nine, 10 meter seas in a place like the Southern Ocean. Coupled with that is the fact that we are going up against poachers and trying to affect their bottom line. My ship's been rammed on a number of occasions. We've had all kinds of dangerous confrontations with ships because we are trying to get between them and their profits. But ultimately, I think there is no greater responsibility, I guess, on us in being able to try to stop suffering than to get on the front lines at the scene of the crime between the poachers and the animals they're trying to kill. There's a saying that says basically that we're borrowing the land from our children, but I really feel that there's a shift at the moment. I want to believe because if I don't believe, it's just such a sad life. I just want to leave a better place for my daughter than now. When I was younger, a young person coming out as gay was seen like as something really bad. And now my daughter is going to grow up in a world where it's actually okay and normal. With our grandparents, mixed marriage like us, did not even exist. And now we're in a world where it's absolutely normal and it's even great. My daughter is a Eurasian and now she's seen as a beauty. Decades ago, she would have been seen as an abnormality. So it's just, to me, it's, these are all signs that we're, we're, we're actually evolving, yeah, we're evolving and, and yeah. the world is getting better. I really believe that today, becoming more plant-based is not a compromise. It's not a sacrifice, mm. it's simply a better way to live. It's gonna make you feel better. It's gonna make you sleep better. It's gonna make your relationships better, not just your relationships with animals and the earth, but also with people. I think it's a much more sustainable way to live. And by doing so, we can really raise the bar on who we are as individuals. The difference I noticed when I changed my diet is that I simply got happier. I felt more connected to the people around me, to myself. I loved myself more, I judged myself and the people around me less. I think it's always good to have the hope. We need to. What Sea Shepherd really represents is this requirement or this necessity for people to take individual action, that problems don't go away because we simply hope that they'll go away. Problems won't go away if we put all the responsibility for solving these problems on government or government agencies. Our own personal involvement is required. That trifecta of being able to protect the environment, save animals, and protect people, that is the those are the three perfect ingredients that give me the motivation to keep going. One simple switch has a profound effect on everything because, I mean, it's, it's not just turning off lights when you're not using it, brushing your teeth and turning off the tap. Those are a small fraction of what's, what actually contributes to a greener and better world. That simple switch of just looking at what you have on your plate is a vote for change, a vote for change for what you'd like to see in the world and for future generations. And it takes everyday people to make that shift and that shift really starts on what you have on your plate. Every time we eat, we have a choice. We can choose health over disease, peace over violence, protection over destruction. Empower yourself with knowledge, and when you do, you can answer that question. Is it time for a change?